Okay, in the old covenant, there was no emphasis on family life. It didn't matter how you lived with your wife. It didn't matter how your children grew up. You could still be a prophet. For example, Moses, the greatest prophet. The only thing we read about his family life is that he had a fight with his wife and his children were this is not made to obey God's word. And another great man in the Old Testament was Samuel. And the only thing we read about his family life is that his children became, uh, they took bribes and uh, the people got fed up and told Samuel, please get rid of your children as judges. So what do we learn from that? That family life is not important. Moses and Samuel were great prophets. And that is a mark of old covenant. An old covenant preacher, it doesn't matter how his family life is, it doesn't matter how his children are. So when you look around at Christianity today, and you see how, you know, Samuel, he promoted his own children to have the same paid job that he had as a judge. So today when you see a pastor who is a paid pastor training his children to take over that job, that's old covenant. And some of those children, when you see a pastor's children wayward, that's old covenant. Or in many places in America, they divorce their wives, marry again and they continue as pastors. That is old covenant. But in the new covenant, it says in 1 Timothy and chapter 3 that you cannot be an elder if you've got more than one wife. If you've divorced somebody and married again, you can never be an elder. And that means you can't have a spiritual sense of position of responsibility in a church. I mean, they can be forgiven. A divorced person can be forgiven and he can go to heaven. But he can have no responsibility in a church, not even a Sunday school teacher or any such thing. But in most Western countries, they don't bother about all that. Which shows that today's Christianity is an old covenant Christianity. They don't bother about new covenant standards. Because it says in 1 Timothy 3 2, an elder must have only one wife. And it also says that he should be able to control his children. And uh, verse 4 and 5, because if he cannot take care of his few children at home, how can he take care of 200 people in a church? That is the argument. That the way a man brings up his children qualifies him to have responsibility in the church. So that shows the tremendous importance of family life. And in Titus, it says that the qualifications of an elder, he says the children must be believers. It's more than controlling them, being disciplined. Verse Titus chapter 1, verse 6, of a man must, elder, he must, the husband of one wife and have children who believe, not accused of rebellion. <clears throat> and we find those many things like this. The standards of the new covenant are disregarded in most of Christianity today. And God has raised us up to stand for those truths and uh, to proclaim these standards. The other thing is, some section like Ephesians 5, where you such details about how a husband must behave with a wife, wife with a husband and children and all that. There's no such passage in the Old Testament, <coughs> which shows again that family life was not at all important in the Old Testament. So, when a husband and wife today do not live,
do not try to live in fellowship like Christ and the church. Even if they sit in CFC, they are like old covenant people. They are not really part of a new covenant church. If you and your husband, you and your wife don't have fellowship, you are not really fit to be in this church. I would advise you to find some other church. There are hundreds of old covenant churches here. That's where you belong. You have to face up to it. But the devil will try his best to lower the standards in the church by bringing in people who have no respect for their family life, whose husband-wife relationship is a mess, whose children are all wayward and ungodly. I would say that, I would tell them straight, you must find some other church. Because if there's not even a desire to repent, see if a person at least acknowledges things are bad and I take the responsibility for my children being astray, then there's hope. We're not saying that we only take perfect people, but we do believe that the only ones who should join the church are those who have a great desire to press on to perfection, to become Christ-like in our personal life, family life, and to bring up our children aright. We're not interested in numbers. See, a lot of people like to join our church because we don't take offerings. And those who love money would be very happy to be in this church because there's no offerings. Nobody asks anybody for money. But we have to be very careful that such people don't come and corrupt the church. And uh, <clears throat> especially with more and more people coming in here, we have to be very, very careful. And they can sit as visitors but never become members of the church. So unless we maintain these strict standards in family life, the devil is out to corrupt every church. And he doesn't corrupt the church by coming like a demon. He corrupts the church by people coming in who don't have the same standards that we proclaim in the church. And who don't even want to have those standards, who have no repentance. Now, because we have proclaimed these standards for 40 years in many places, we have seen wonderful families in almost all of our churches, godly couples, not perfect, but who are quick to ask forgiveness and apologize, quick to acknowledge their faults, and who are seeking to bring up their children in a godly way. And uh, we're thankful for that. We want that testimony to continue everywhere. See, a lot of people say that <clears throat> children are different, so some people turn out differently. But that's not what God's Word says. God's Word says that here's a condition attached to a promise in Proverbs 22. Proverbs is one of those rare, almost like a new covenant book in the Old Testament. Many things in Proverbs are almost like new covenant standards. And Proverbs 22, 6 says, If you train up a child <coughs> in the way he should go, when he's old, he will not depart from it. So when you see children who have departed from the Lord's way, when they grow older, I tell the parents, the first thing you need to do is fall on your face before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I did not obey your word. I did not bring up my children in the way they should go. And the responsibility, the Bible says, is primarily on the father. The Bible does not say, parents, bring up your children uh, in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, 
I want to say to all the fathers here, your wife is not responsible for bringing up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You fathers, Ephesians 6, 4 is clear, fathers, not parents, fathers, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And if you bring them up in childhood in that way, when they are old, they will not depart from it. That is God's promise. So if they depart from it, it means you did not do the job when you were young. When they were young, you just took it easy and carelessly. And I've seen that happen. And uh, sometimes it is too late to do anything for those children because they've grown up. It's like a tree, you know. When it's a, if it's growing crooked as a little plant, you can straighten it. But once it's become a tree, you can't bend it anymore. It's become so, it's like that with children. Once they become older, um, so all of you who got young children and new babies being born, start from a very young age. When does a child understand the word no? I'll tell you. When it is one year old. I don't remember my children when they were one year old, but I see my grandchildren when they are one year old. And I actually saw this. One of my grandchildren was trying to climb up the stairs at age one. And my son said, no. So the child stopped. It did not go up the stairs. The next day, I saw the child going towards the stairs and looking around to see if anybody was watching. I learned something that day. That child not only understood the meaning of no, but has got a memory that reminds it, I was told yesterday not to climb these stairs. So when are you going to teach your children the importance of the word no? One year. But some parents are so compassionate, oh, they're little children, don't trouble them. Then there'll be a headache for you when they're in their teenage years. You either follow the word of God or you follow human psychology and your own ideas. You are the one who's going to suffer. So it's very, very important. Now I say to you, dear brothers and sisters, let us be different from the godless families around us in Christendom. And if there are any godless families sitting here, be different from them. Don't follow their example because it says here, immediately after this section on family life in Ephesians chapter 5 and chapter 6, the very next thing it says is how the devil comes to fight. Uh, stand against the devil, it says. It's that, you know where that section comes? It's only once in scripture it comes about putting on the armor of God to fight against the devil. And it comes immediately after this long section on family life. Husband, wife, father, children, servants, masters. In those days, servants and masters are also in the house. So, that shows that spiritual warfare is primarily related to the home. That's where the devil attacks. The first home that God made, Adam and Eve, he attacked. And as soon as they had a child, Cain, he got a hold of Cain and made him jealous of his brother and murdered his brother. So you see how, what do you read in Genesis chapter 3 and 4? As soon as God made man and blessed him, the very next thing you read is the devil coming and attacking, separating Adam and Eve and destroying their eldest son who became a cursed person. So this is written in the beginning of the Bible as a warning to all of us. So it's very, very strong. That's why in all these 40 years, whenever I've preached a message, I've always emphasized family life because that is the foundation on which we build the church. As you've often heard me say, the ground floor, the foundation is God's perfect love for us. On that, the ground floor is uh, walking with God with a clear conscience. And then the first floor on top is our family life 
and then the second floor is the church. You can't build a church if you don't build a family life and you don't walk with God with a clear conscience. So that's a mistake that's happening all over Christendom. And we want to make sure in our CFC churches that does not happen. And there's no place here for a false compassion. We have to be very firm with our children. And we've got to, and if any children are bringing dishonor to the Lord's name, we have to warn the parents, be careful they don't ruin them and ruin their children and ruin their own lives.